yes, we might as well just get started to not waste anyone's time. Um, we would like, or oh, very happy that you're joining our webinar on safe hydrogen service today. Um, the agenda. There it comes. Um, the agenda for today is a focus on hydrogen testing um, here at Force Technology and today we focus on how to qualify materials and products for safe hydrogen service. Um, this is what my colleague Johan and I will be talking about in the first presentation. Uh, then our colleague Lars will talk about risk and safety, which is an important aspect of hydrogen service. And then we joined forces with TGC, Danish Gas Technological Center, um, and they will tell about their hydrogen testing with a special focus on leaks. Um, and just a few practicalities. During the webinar, you are all muted, I assume, and you won't have any uh, possibility to speak, but you're very welcome to write questions in the chat. And we have a, a tight program today, a lot of people, so maybe one or two questions are are answered and then we'll reach out after the webinar if there's a lot of questions. And after the webinar, you also receive the slides and, and a video recording. So the entire webinar is being recorded. In case you don't know us uh, at Force Technology, we are the largest RGO in Denmark. We are independent, self-governing, and we have a strong Scandinavian base. Uh, we provide services to the international market. And within hydrogen, we focus on materials and welding. We have a long history in that. Uh, general testing, mechanical testing, all sorts of testing. Uh, fracture mechanics, also with a focus on simulation. Flow measurements and simulations, uh, metrology. We uh, have a metrology department, department also focusing a lot on hydrogen. Um, in case that is a key interest to you, they have also posted some webinars on that topic. We also do emission measurements and unsigned inspections related to hydrogen. And today is a series of webinars. I've pre previously uh, talked a lot about hydrogen in different materials, and we have some previous webinars in case that is something very interesting to you. Today, we don't have the time to dig very deep into that, so I'll just quickly touch on the focus. And um, But you're very welcome to contact us if this is an interest. But with focus on hydrogen and materials, which is where we come from, what are we afraid of? Um, of course, there's the aspect of leakers, um, which is what DTC will talk about later. But from our mechanical and functional component perspective, it is fractures because hydrogen is able to diffuse into the material, create hydrogen embrittlement and cause quite rapid and catastrophic failures. This is just an example of a large metallic component, a bolt, where we have a small, very small initiation of hydrogen embrittlement fracture, resulting in a huge fracture, um, a final ductile overload. So it is definitely something to consider and a key concern. And currently a lot of uh, studies ongoing on metallic materials, especially with embrittlement due to hydrogen. And it is quite easy to take, this is an example of a uh, tensile test sample where you would normally have some ductile properties and necking of your sample. If you charge it in hydrogen, you will have an embrittled material and you'll see that effect. But our focus at force technology is, well, it's quite easy to show that hydrogen may cause damage, but where are the limits? Um, and this is what we're working with. Are we able to define some safe zones? Well, um, that is a question because it all comes down to sufficient amounts of hydrogen present in a microstructure that is susceptible and then a mechanical load that may cause hydrogen embrittlement. So the environment, the hydrogen may come from corrosion. In this case, uh, hydrogen gas, uh, hydrogen production. The mechanical loads may be from a weld or residual stresses in a component um, or dynamic loads. The material susceptibility is something we'll uh, focus on later today. Depends on chemical composition, microstructure, if there's some flaws or weld defects. So how do we even evaluate hydrogen compatibility and if a product is safe for hydrogen? Um, as material specialists, 
we find it very interesting to look dig deep into that. Um, but what we meet is suppliers uh, which are met with the demand if their product is safe for hydrogen service or not, and how do we evaluate that? Well, there are several methods. Uh, one is made by NASA. They have compared tensile properties in air to those in hydrogen and rated the materials with uh, are they extremely embrittled by uh, hydrogen compatibility or not. And basically what we get out of it is a list of materials that are already used. Some of them maybe not the most compatible for hydrogen service, such as some of the pipeline, pipeline materials and even uh, 4140, which is apparently extremely embrittled is used for high pressure gas containers. So it is not a clear picture because how are you even able to use a very sensitive material? Um, that depends on design for the high pressure containers. It is a matter of thinking about design, pressure level, stress level and material and and uh, doing a holistic evaluation rather than just looking at at a single material. Another method is the ISO TRR 15916. Same approach, uh, looking at materials, saying are they embrittled or not, um, but looking or digging a bit deeper. Uh, the list shows that especially for gases, hydrogen, uh, very few are deemed suitable. Some are deemed not suitable for hydrogen and most of them have an E saying evaluation needed. So how do we test this? Um, at FORS, we've done this for 40, 40 plus years, starting with the oil and gas industry, doing special testing, designing realistic test environments. Um, and this is also what we're doing for the power to x We definitely see testing as an enabler for safe hydrogen service because you may take a study, but applying it to an actual product with all the residual stresses, material combinations is a different, different thing. And it may actually push and change things. Uh, just a quick example, ASMA B3112, which is uh, a well-known guide, uh, guideline or standard for, for hydrogen transport. A very extensive test series was made, allowing the use of X70 pipeline steels to be used at a higher design pressure without a penalty. So that actually changed the standard. Similarly, here at uh, Force Technology, in collaboration with uh, DGC, we did a full scale test uh, in a, a long term project. This was the actual uh, pipeline in the Danish gas grid exposed to 100% hydrogen gas and following the test, no observed crack growth was, before, was observed after full scale testing. In a bit more detail, the testing focused on how to use hydrogen in the gas grid and would it actually affect the formation of fatigue cracks because we know that especially hydrogen affects the dynamic properties and the whole discussion of pressure variations is highly relevant. Um, a section with uh, more than 20 years of operation was taking out the grass, gas grid and exposed to hydrogen and loaded dynamically. Uh, to 70 bars with an amplitude of uh, 30 bars, which was double the actual pressure variation in the system. Um, just some old plots showing. Uh, tests were run at 0 0.007 hertz and simulating to start with 40 years of operation, but because tests went so well, another 40 years were added to that. And the metallurgical examination along with NDT methods, also sonic testing and MPI showed no crack formation, even in region, regions um, at the well tour like this, where we would expect a fatigue crack initiate to, uh, in case there was a problem, no cracking was observed. So to sum up on that, uh, it was quite successful and definitely a stepping stone for allowing 100% hydrogen in the Danish gas grid at some point. And this is something we would like to continue with uh, because we believe that full scale testing is an enabler for safe hydrogen service, both for large uh, pipeline structures, but also minor components. Um, again, pipeline is a big focus point here at, at the time, but the pipeline standard SMB 3112 allows for 
an option A, where you take a penalty factor on your calculations, or B, where you have a focus on testing. But um, the extent of testing is quite heavily discussed because you actually should take out samples every 1.6 kilometers. And if you have a large grid, this doesn't really make sense. And you could ask if it's really wise to interfere with the present condition of a well working pipeline just to test the properties. So we believe that a reduced test scope where you target the weakest link through full scale testing would be even more beneficial and actually add safety to the entire um, evaluation. And why do we see the full scale test? Well, you preserve, if you take a pipeline, you preserve the residual stresses and actual conditions, um, the same surface properties. Once you start cutting small scale specimens, you release some stresses from the structure. And uh, like the cycling set test I just showed, you are able to simulate conditions during service in a better way than just small scale testing, um, where you your gain is the factor mechanics properties. And on, on top of that, you may be able to explore the limits of capacity of the actual pipeline. So we are establishing uh, test facilities for the standard qualification testing, according to ASMA B7112. But together with DGC, we are also able to provide these full scale tests, which we believe would add more safety. Um, and that is our key focus, testing to ensure safe hydrogen service. Um, and of course, we have some experience as to how do we design a test and define relevant parameters, um, functional testing of components um, to simulate safe hydrogen service in realistic environment is something we have experience with. Um, of course, we don't want to make a test that's overly conservative. It should simulate uh, the actual conditions. Um, and hydrogen may, of course, cause damage. But where are the limits? That is something we are working extensively with. So um, that was everything from me. And I would like to pass on to my colleague, Johan, unless there's a bunch of questions. doesn't appear that there are any questions at this point. Great. So I will try to take over from here. Yes. Yes. So uh, my name is Johan Nielsen and as Dita said, I work with her on a lot of uh, our hydrogen testing. Uh, and today I'll just briefly take you through a case example of, of how we do this, how we test uh, material compatibility in an actual component um so yeah Let's see if it's uh, i may have a bit of delay oh, okay there we go so yeah as Dita said there are a lot of uh, different um yeah there are some different guidelines and standards that will help us to figure out is the material like is the material we want to use is it suitable or not uh we will see a lot of them get the rating as in need of evaluation and some of them are deemed not suitable so what do we do with like with the full scale testing of, uh, of pipelines what do we do if we have um, in existing infrastructure and components from that we want to use and how do we know if it's safe so in order to do that uh, we need to uh, understand that real life is not a test bed so while these standards and guidelines are very good for giving an indication of what uh, what dangers we might have directly related to material, when we're talking full components, we want to look at what are the conditions and the exposure time for this component. What kind of loads and stresses uh, are we dealing with? Because they may be very different than the minimum criteria that we see in the test uh, for the guidelines and standards. And then, of course, as always, we need to remember that accelerated testing is not the same as real life. We want something that is comparable. We don't want to be too mild on the product or component, and we don't want it to be too harsh either. So we are failing components that otherwise might be very suitable. Um, this is also a matter of how do we make sure that we don't have to start from scratch with everything. We might have very good components that we can just use if we know they're safe. So. What we like to do is testing that is done right for the purpose. So we're going to push the material in a way that and the component in a way that's matching the 
the actual conditions they will experience. So if we have something, for example, a valve in a pipeline um, that will get long term exposure. So in order to that, like to assess the compatibility of this, we need to make sure that the material is saturated with hydrogen that is fully charged. Um, and a test we use here is the permeability test. We talked about that in some of our previous webinars, um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this now. Um, and then, of course, we want to test the functionality because we want to know does our component actually operate as intended in hydrogen atmosphere? Um, and last but not least, we want to test it to failure. A good way to know if something is safe is to know when it fails. And in this case, that will be a burst test. So just to understand why are we using permeability? Uh, first of all, permeability varies for different materials. And even if you have something like the 4130 uh, um, material here, we have it in two different conditions. We have a normalized and we have a tempered and quenched. And even though they have the same chemical composition, they actually have difference in permeability. You see that from the very light blue and the very dark blue uh, dot on the scale. So the reason for this is that the permeability depends on a lot of different factors. We have the surface effects that are affecting how we have the adsorption of hydrogen on the surface. We have the crystal lattice that is affecting the diffusivity and the solubility. And we also have imperfections in the material that are also affecting both. And in some cases, trapping hydrogen so in total, the permeability is a product of diff diffusivity and solubility. And the easiest way to measure it and the way it is measured is that you have a component that you're exposing to pressure of hydrogen from one side. And then once you reach a steady state of diffusion through the material, that's where you calculate your permeability. That also means that once you have a steady state, flow through the material that it is fully charged. You have trapped the hydrogen you can trap inside the material, which means now it is as brittle as we can get it if it does become brittle due to hydrogen. So we start out by doing the permeability testing. So when we do that, we make sure we use the surface as it is intended to be in the application or component because we want to have these surface effects like how they influence the absorption because what we want to do with the permeation uh, permeability testing, we want to determine how long do we need to charge the material in order to make sure that it is fully charged and we have as brittle as it can get. So it's very this is a very simple sketch just showing like we have an inlet from the bottom. We have the test material. We may need to test different materials because components are often not just used or not made of just one material and then we will measure it and once we have the steady state we will know this is our charge time so once we've done that we want to do the functionality testing so we want to simulate the service conditions with the design pressure and the operation of the component and in this particular case we did a full lifetime worth of uh, pressurizing and uh, depressurizing um, and we did it all in one day so of course it depends on how many times you expect it to be operated. It may have to take more than one day, but in this case it was possible to do in one day. And once that's done and we see that our component functions, uh, we don't, you know, nothing has cracked inside, we can still operate it. Uh, then we go to the burst test and the burst test and also the upper, like uh, the functionality test was done both in hydrogen atmosphere and in nitrogen. So we have a comparison between something that's inert and where we want to see is there a risk with hydrogen. So the burst test is quite simple. What you do is you build up the pressure gradually uh, and eventually you get a leak. Or, um, that can be for various reasons. Uh, in this case, the failure happened at approximately the same pressure. Um, and actually, it was not the steel or the the material, uh, the metallic components uh, in this product that were failing. It was actually the gasket being pushed out. So 
what is quite important to take away from this is that even though we in this component had materials um, that are characterized as not suitable under the design, uh, like due to the design and the operating conditions that is intended to be used for, um, is actually safe. It's it's not going to suddenly burst open, uh, causing havoc just because there are some materials that are not suitable. Of course, you can't take this and generalize and say, okay, then we just use this for whatever. No, you need to know what are your design parameters and the key is to test it so you know if it's safe or not. And that was like a very short version of um, how a test can be done. Great, and then uh, unless we have any additional questions, I will pass it we on to Lars. Actually, we, we do. do. Yeah. Perfect, I can't I, see it for so Yeah, but Elgor Jensen has yeah. asked a question and I would assume it, it uh, was for you because it it uh, appeared uh, the same second as uh, Johan started. Okay, perfect. Uh, is any testing being done from force within the marine sector? Would you answer that, Dita? Uh, yes, I'm sure you could as well. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, we've done the marine sector. I'm not sure if that's vessels or offshore and or platforms, oil and gas, but basically just taking metallic materials. We also have colleagues working with polymers, concrete, uh, and exposing it to environments, whether it's corrosion or mechanical environments. Uh, we do pretty much everything. So yes, that's a yes. Great. Thank you. If uh, if you're yeah, but if you're interested in more specific uh, answers uh, than than that, you're most welcome to contact us afterwards. Yes, definitely. Well, I guess that means uh, it would be my turn. Mm -hmm. And um, that shouldn't assess any technical problems, right? Perfect. As you saw uh, at the very beginning, did it presented it um, that um, I was going to talk about risk assessment or risk management, and that is exactly what I intend to do. My name is uh, Lars Nørn Nielsen. Um, from the very beginning, I, I would state that this subject is not as exotic as uh, the component test. I mean, they have a lot of pictures and, and delicious stuff. I can't present that, so uh, we'll just have to take it uh, from the end and uh, have a look at it. But what is essential uh, is that we could not do any of the testing we are doing here unless uh, point one, we had a technical knowledge about the, the components on how they could fail, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to, to predict how we should do any mitigation actions. Uh, that's one thing, and the other thing is that uh, my presentation will consist more or less of uh, two parts because in, in the project we have worked both uh, with lab tests and with a more uh, system approach or uh, enterprise approach. Uh, I will get back to that, of course, but uh, the interesting part is that we actually cover, uh, on some basis at least, uh, the most of what you would expect from a risk system in an enterprise. Let's get started. I have tried to uh, to line it up here uh, in this uh, pyramid or triangle, where we have the very top have the risk management system. The risk management system would be on the enterprise level. That means that it should be from the very top of the organization. Um, uh, and include a quality uh, risk management system, preferably. It doesn't always do that. But uh, it goes without saying that uh, it's an extensive system. And uh, of course, we have had no uh, interest or uh, you could say money to, to do a complete guide for doing this. But what we have done is we have prepared a guideline uh, for those who have no background for working with hydrogen, but 
nevertheless would like to uh, to start some activities up in their company um, so as to be able to contact the correct uh, uh, governmental uh, uh, sections and so on. Um, and um, also, a, you could say a general guideline how to do the risk management that would be a mandatory activity from uh, the, the government. Then the next uh, the center part of the pyramid here would be the risk assessment, which you could say is on a system level. This is kind of my own definition, but it's 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 not wrong, but but it's not fully it does, doesn't fully cover all activities. But you could say it's on a system level. That is now we are no we have hands on, and and the last level here, the root cause analysis level, is on component level, and. Um, as you might have uh, found from from Peter's presentation, um, in in the area of system level and component level, that is the level where force technology prevails normally. We work uh, with intensively with, with materials and components and so on, which is to say that uh, all risk management would be born out of that. Um, but I would like to come up with a visualization on how this system would work uh, in, in a real enterprise system. Um, it's a bit difficult to explain and I won't spend too much time on it, but what I would like to say is we have a situation with safe operation in the left part in the green uh, oval. And um, during the operational phase, we, uh, we tend to Build in barriers to ensure that we would not come in uh, in a threatening situation, or we have a hazard, or, or whatever it might be, that would uh, would uh, interfere with the safety. But as all know, you can build all the barriers you will. Um, at some point, we would have some holes, and if we are in a very unlucky situation, we would penetrate until we reach the threat. If we are really, really uh, unlucky, uh, we will also experience a major accident that was, would follow as a consequence of the of the threat. So that is what we're trying to prevent, and we do that through the design phase, of course. Everything we do, we design with the best of our ability to prevent that we would ever end up in a major accident situation. And once we're in the operational phase, we also have a lot of documentation for system and process that is uh, the closest to the to the process uh, system we have a lot of company documentation or requirements and uh, of course we have also the governmental documentation all this documentation should be in place before we start a system and that is a lot uh, to cope uh, and besides you would also have to have a lot of knowledge about how things work uh to be able to to uh, carry out this uh risk assessment or risk uh, management system assessment i will give you one example also for visualization but also because that is the method that we have used in uh, in the lab scale uh, risk assessment it's called the bow tie Many of you working with uh, risk assessment would be completely familiar with it, but I would present it here so if we everyone could could see what we are working with. It takes it or its origin in the threat that I mentioned before. What could happen? It could be a fire, it could be an explosion, or something like that. And from that threat, we would go backwards via and risk uh, root cause analysis to find what could be the root cause for ending up in this threat. In this, uh, threat. Um, in most cases, we would experience that one root cause would not cover. So we would end up with five or 10 or 15 root causes that could lead to this condition. On the other side of the threat, we will have to do a consequence analysis. If we experience a threat, what could happen? Uh, 
and we would have a number of consequences. That might be a complete burn down of the factory, that might be loss of uh, human lives, and so on and so on. So now it goes without saying that we do not want to end up in this situation. Preferably, we would like to avoid the threat, which is why we would do some preventive actions. But if it happens anyway, I mean, holes in the barriers, we should also be able to have a situation control so we could prevent the consequences from happening. So what we do is, of course, we build in some preventive uh, measures that might be sensors, alarms, uh, lights, and so on. Uh, depending on the threat itself, uh, it has to be customized. But the very good thing about this is that if we know the likelihood of failure or the likelihood of not failure for each of these, we could actually calculate um, some kind of um, uh, probability for getting into the situation with a threat. Of course, we do that for all the root causes and end up with a system where we have an overview of what to do. In this project, we have uh, used the bowtie method for the, the lab test that Johan was uh, talking about, and also for the full scale component test that, yeah, Johan and Dilip was talking about. Of course, uh, when we are talking risk, we can't avoid talking about what is the risk. And um, I won't dwell too much about, uh, around this one, but, but uh, just say that we have the risk matrix in this uh, particular case. It is a three times uh, three matrix. It might be a five times five and, and so on. Uh, they do not differ in their function, but they differ in their uh, details. Uh, in this case, we have a probability of one to three, as I said, and uh, it's very, very important that before you start a lab or start a test or start a, anything that would involve, for instance, hydrogen, ammonia or whatever, that you uh, in the company or at least in the in the group where you're going to work with this, and you have um, the same uh, approach to what is the risk, what is the probability, what is the consequence, and thereby what would the risk classes cover. Uh, this is completely customized and it's, uh, I mean, it's workmanship to do this. So um, that is important to, to line up. And the other important thing is that this is not a desktop job. You would have to involve all the parties that would work with this including technicians and so on. In this particular case, we uh, we did it the simple way, using a spreadsheet to uh, to split all the uh, threats, the root causes, uh, probability, consequence, and so on. And of course, you can see this, but it's not so important. It's in Danish anyway, uh, because we had the technicians uh, with. So, but the important part is to say that we sh simply did the, the threat analysis, the root cause analysis, first assessment, and here you can see at uh, the very middle here, that we have some red, some yellow, and according to the risk matrix that I presented uh, on the last slide, uh, we cannot accept that. So we have to do something about it to bring the risk down. And uh, in this particular case, we have uh, listed all the the mitigating actions as to uh, to the uh, preventive actions and also for the reduction of consequences. That covered all the lower part in, in the pyramid. As for the top part, the risk management part, our intentions for this project, as you will hear, the error points upwards, um, the intention for this project was actually to help all small and medium uh, enterprises in, in specifically Denmark to have some kind of aid for getting this up and running. Um, what we would like to, to do is prepare a general uh, guideline 
for establish, establishing facilities uh, in order to handle, for instance, hydrogen. In this case, it would be specifically uh, prepared for hydrogen, but it wouldn't be too uh, too uh, difficult to to change it to anything else you would like to work with. For instance, uh, ammonia. What it would cover is the definition of uh, the governmental uh, requirements. That is, who to contact, who are all the, the parties that would be involved in this. And uh, I can tell you we have quite a few that would be have, have to be involved in this. And how to handle uh, the documentation for this. It also would introduce the basis for the risk management. Uh, and most importantly, uh, here we have the gray zone or the uh, what you could say the borderline to, to what I just explained here, the risk screening, because this is actually what is a, a top down system for screening the risk uh, on a level that is higher than what I presented just before, but it would be the basis for doing the specific analysis. What we are working with uh, is something quite new within the process industry, uh, namely the inherent risk. Uh, inherent risk is another way to see it and would in most cases be preferable to address all the risks that could occur out of the project. I will come a little bit back to that. Uh, we have uh, formulated a demonstration project with Hydrogen Valley in Kobro in Denmark. Uh, that is a test facility for uh, hydrogen uh, components of hydrogen systems, where we try to to test out this uh, the performance of the guideline and the robustness. Because in the end, uh, you could do a lot of the desktop, but you will have to do it in the real world to be able to to qualify the the guideline. Uh, I will, as I promised you, come back to the inherent risk. What is that? It has been uh, widely used within the financial sector uh, and is uh, actually uh, it's it's a requirement for the financial uh, sector that they do uh, an inherent risk uh, of, of the of the processes within the financial sector um, what it really tells you about is what is the born with uh, born with the uh, which 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 sorry which risk uh, is it born with? Um, as you can see here, the level one risk would be, for instance, process fraud, fraud um, external impacts on the system, IT systems, and so on. And in most cases, as a technical project leader, you would do the most of this, but some things might uh, slip your mind. Uh, and this is where this prevails because IT systems well, if you do not know anything about IT systems, in in many cases, you would simply say, uh, we simply uh, detach it from, from the system and then, uh, or from the network, and then we will have no problems. But actually, you, you don't know if that is the case if you do not do an analysis. So what we are up against here is a lot of level one risks uh, with a very broad spectrum. And uh, on next level, you will be down to a level where you approach what I talked about before. The data security would be for IT systems, for instance, system breakdown, loss of data, system errors, unintended access to data, and so on. And this is actually necessary if you are trying to build up some kind of enterprise uh, where you will be working with hazardous uh, substances like hydrogen or toxic substances. You would have to be in control of this because otherwise you can imagine what what could happen from the outside so that is basically what we have been working on with this uh, the demonstration project is not finished yet but um, we are well on on the way i would say and i think that was what i had to present from my hand are there any questions? Thank you, Lars. Uh, there's no questions in the chat, at least not to uh, risk and safety yet, but they might come. 
So uh, thank you so much and let us uh, let Martin continue. And now I think you can hear me as well. And uh, hello, my name is uh, Martin Bjarna, and uh, I'm from uh, the Danish Gas Technology Center. I'm a project manager there. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, a, a couple of uh, different uh, demonstration projects and uh, tests that we've per performed in our lab uh, on uh, both. Uh, uh, hydrogen enriched uh, natural gas, as well as uh, as hydrogen uh, as test with pure hydrogen. But my focus today will, will probably will be mostly on uh, hydrogen enriched enriched natural gas, uh, whereas the previous presentation has focused more on uh, on pure hydrogen. But just uh, for a quick overview for those who don't know us, where DGC is a uh, a specialized consulting and development company with the, the main, foc main focus areas within uh, gas utilization and gas technology. And uh, we are owned jointly by the Danish TSO and the DSO, uh, having about uh, 35 uh, employees, give or take. Uh, and we offer consulting services within both research uh, and uh, development projects to participate in, laboratory testing measurements in our labs, and participate and perform uh, various demonstration projects. Traditionally, that has been uh, primarily within uh, natural gas uh, and uh, upgraded biogas, uh, also, uh, also hydrogen projects, but that's uh, the main focus has pre previously been natural gas. That's lately been shifting more towards uh, hydrogen and uh, Hydrogen and rich natural gas, uh, which is also, as I said, uh, what I will be talking about today, the more practical aspects of what we're, we've been doing over the last couple of years. So, to begin with, you've already heard uh, how hydrogen can have uh, negative materialistic uh, uh, consequences in, in terms of uh, hydrogen embrittlement, for instance. But uh, Hydrogen also uh, differs quite a lot from uh, from natural from the properties of natural gas uh, in many other ways that can make it uh, well at least challenging to use or convert uh, the usage from natural gas to hydrogen. One uh, one challenge you could say is that uh, hydrogen is a lot more fugitive than uh, than hydrogen in the sense that uh, as uh, you can imagine the density of uh, Hydrogen is much lower than uh, that of natural gas. It, uh, as uh, I think Dieter said, it has a high diffusion rate. It can diffuse through materials much better than natural gas and through air. Essentially, it's much smaller than methane being the main component of natural gas, which means that a methane type system is not necessarily a hydrogen type system. So if you convert, uh, there's been a lot of talk lately about converting natural gas lines to uh, either the operation of pure hydrogen or, or, or with the hydrogen being in, added to the natural gas. And uh, in that case, there's no guarantee that your system will be tight and you and there's been a lot of talk of whether you can risk a, what we call a heterogeneous leakage, meaning that the system is actually in a natural gas type. But if you have a mixture of natural gas and hydrogen, then the hydrogen can still leak from the system. And that is, of course, uh, both a safety concern, but also uh, an environmental concern in the sense that both methane and hydrogen are greenhouse gases, even though hydrogen is uh, much less potent than, uh, than methane. Um, there's also uh, different, hydrogen also has different combustion pro properties. Um, Namely, for instance, that the energy density is uh, approximately three times lower than that of natural gas. It has a broader flammability region or ignition region. And it has a very high flame velocity compared to, or a higher flame velocity compared to natural gas. You can see in the table that it's roughly a factor of 10 in the flame velocity. 
and also in the relative densities. So I've marked here the, the smallness because I'm going to be looking at projects that focus on tightness and also the flame velocity, which is uh, important for combustion processes for when you mix hydrogen with natural gas and then uh, try to uh, combust it in, uh, uh, you can say, utilities that are actually designed for natural, for natural gas and not mixtures of hydrogen and natural gas. So first, uh, a project that's been concluded and uh, actually has been performed for quite a number of years. It's uh, a project that did it, uh, also talked about uh, because it was some of the work was done in collaboration with FORSA. Some of the tests on the metallic materials were, were performed were by uh, FORSA and in collaboration with FORSA. But actually the main focus on uh, the project was uh, on uh, the polymer materials uh, in, of the distribution grid where pure hydrogen was uh, injected into a miniature distribution grid which was constructed both from new component components but also of uh, components which has been uh, say discarded from the grid from old components in the grid it was most, mostly p80 and p100 uh, and uh, this uh, system was to run uh, for about 12 years, this miniature grid. And whereas the frequent leaks were observed, uh, for instance, due to uh, pro product uh, say, uh, tolerances in the production of the some components that uh, showed to be too wide, uh, then uh, when that was uh, the manufacturer was asked to produce it more accurately, then that could be made tight. But there was some systems where we saw that uh, for natural gas, the system was actually tight, but uh, the connections were not necessarily tight for hydrogen. But the overall conclusion from that, that study for, the, uh, for the, the PE components were actually that the pipes were not altered the me mechanical properties were not all altered by the presence of hydrogen. So the the grid, uh, the, the PE grid, seems actually from this test to be quite suitable for the transport of hydrogen, except of course that you see a higher permeability through the pipe wall of hydrogen compared to that of natural gas. In fact, about 20% of the measured leakage rate uh, was estimated to be due to hydrogen going through the the PE walls. So and uh, but in terms of uh, of energy, uh, because uh, as I said, hydrogen has a lower energy density than uh, natural gas. You actually see that it was more or less the, the same amount in terms of energy that diffused through the walls, whereas it was a higher uh, the higher volume. Um, another project that uh, that we've uh, assisted in, uh, been a part of, uh, and are still working on, is a demonstration project uh, where uh, we, together with the Energinet as the main lead on the project, has uh, uh, they've constructed, a, I can say, a closed loop uh, grid that also mimics uh, the different pressures in both the transmission, main distribution, and distribution grid that you can see uh, a sketch of here where you have both uh, the N80 bar part of the grid, which has operated more or less around in this test about 65 bars, a 40 bar part of, part of the main, a main distribution part. So these are steel parts and then a four bar part of the grid. Um, so you go through all, all the different uh, pressure, pressure levels in the grid and it all actually Built from uh, from components of the grid, it's uh, decommissioned parts of the of the natural gas grid, which coincidentally and quite conveniently are quite it's uh, two MR stations that are quite uh, that are located right next to each other, so that means that it was uh, less cost intensive and uh, uh, convenient, much more convenient to construct this closed loop. So. The loop here has been uh, used as a demonstration project for 
injection of uh, hydrogen into natural gas. We have a natural gas peak coming from uh, the main part of the grid into this, the loop over here. I hope you can see my mouse. And uh, originally, it was also planned that uh, it was supposed to uh, be supplied with hydrogen from an elect electrolysis unit, but uh, that uh, ultimately uh, the usage was made, the addition of, hyd of hydrogen was mainly done through uh, bottled uh, hydrogen gas. And you can say in these kind of systems where the, it's a closed loop system, you don't really need that much hydrogen if the system is tight. You know, you would only need it if you have to evacuate the system at, at times or if you increase the concentration. So the phase phase one, which was supported by the EUDP uh, and uh, ran until about, uh, I think it was 2019, uh, went up to uh, a mixture, admixture of hydrogen to the natural gas of 15 volume percent, 12 percent long term, and was uh, long term tested over a two year period. And right now we're running, or oh, Nikinet is running a phase two, where the plan is to go up to 25% uh, hydrogen injected into the natural gas. And I think right now this is, it's around 20%. Um, before all this was done, the, all the, inject, the injection of hydrogen and the, the buildup of the, of the closed loop system, the construction of it, uh, the leakages was given a special focus here. So essentially the question, I, I, the, uh, the property I put up in the, the first slide about hydrogen is, the question is here, can we keep the small hydrogen molecules relative compared to the natural gas? Or can, or do, can we not keep the system designed for hydrogen tight? So before startup, the system was uh, tested statically with the uh, forming or formia gas, which is 90% uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah, N2 now, it's, that's, and 10% uh, uh, hydrogen. Um, and it was tested at, uh, that, uh, was that gas was tested at the fine pressure, so slightly above the, the operation pressure that uh, this, the test site has actually been operating with. Um, and it was, uh, you can say, done in the old fashioned way where you test with the soap water and the balloons and the on valves, whether the system is tight or not. So uh, it's a classic and old technique that most of you will know from just uh, fixing a tire, but uh, it's, uh, it works. And, uh, and from that test, uh, 11 leaks were identified, which uh, where you needed to actually do some uh, some action like uh, exchanging a, a gasket or a valve. Uh, and then periodically the, the fellow facility was tested during the test phase. Uh, ultimately, you still, still saw that uh, we were losing some gas, but, uh, but uh, that it weren't, uh, the a mass balance analysis showed also that uh, it was only about 0 0.1 normal cubic meters per day that was lost this way. Uh, and there were no indications of a heterogeneous leak. You can see that in the graph here in that the hydrogen concentration is roughly constant, whereas the total volume decreases over this uh, three months period. Um, and we've performed, uh, TGC has performed uh, uh, a measurement of the methane emission where we attempted to quantify this uh, using a leak detection and methane sniffers. Um, and then in this test here, we actually found that you can say that the, the mass balance analysis was performed on data from uh, the beginning of uh, 2019, whereas uh, the, the methane emissions were performed during June 2020. We found about twice the emissions as the mass balance analysis shows. So there is a bit of discrepancy, of course, uh, likely it's not, not in a completely different order of magnitude, but there are some differences. Uh, whether that's due to a gasket or something else beginning to leak more, we can't say at this point, uh, but we'll, we aim to perform this similar test later in phase two. Finally, 
we are also doing some tests in our lab. Uh, in the, we're part of the Tiger project, uh, which stands for testing hydrogen admixture for gas applications, uh, where we are the lead of the, the work package three on experimental work. And the project uh, aims at the, or the, the part work package three aims at the testing end user appliances for how they behave with the hydrogen added to the natural gas. Um, because when you replace natural gas by hydrogen without changing the air quantity, uh, then the excess air will increase, which will uh, affect the, the flame velocity, the temperature, and the, what the, the flue gas losses will be. So for instance, for atmospheric burners, the flame velocity will, uh, will increase uh, due to uh, the increased air excess, and uh, that can, in certain cases, cause a flashback, which you can see here on the on the graph, where where it plots the carbon monoxide uh, as a function of time, as well as the uh, CO2 emissions. And after almost 20 minutes, you see that the uh, the carbon monoxide concentration increases dramatically, and that's where we see a flashback. After quite some time, normally with natural gas application, we would see that much sooner. It should be mentioned that uh, we haven't seen this for concentrations below 30% of hydrogen added to the gas. So this is with 60% hydrogen added to the natural gas. You can see the flashback visually here. After 15 seconds and five minutes, the flame seems relatively stable. But after eight minutes, it starts to, uh, to uh, yeah, you, you, know, you see a start of a flashback, which also uh, actually damages the burner, as you can see in the other picture on the right. For premix appliances, uh, it's a, a different problem. It's the principal issue here is uh, that you can adjust the air access uh, through uh, either the oxygen or the CO2 level which when you then add hydrogen or remove hydrogen, uh, so which can also happen, uh, then uh, you can have uh, large uh, emissions of, uh, of carbon monoxide. For instance, here, if you adjust to about 4% of oxygen and then the gas quality changes with, no, with hydrogen, then you can have a, a tenfold increase in the carbon monoxide. But if you want to hear more about this project, then uh, they actually have a webinar just in two days, which you can sign up for at uh, the Tuga project at EU. Um, yeah. And finally, I'll just uh, mention that uh, FORSA and DGC, to, uh, supported by the UDP Green Labs Deco, has uh, established the Hydrogen Technology Test Center with the main objective of developing uh, test facilities and knowledge in order to support and facilitate the development of hydrogen technologies. And that means in, the, in GGC that uh, in the coming years, we will uh, develop, uh, further develop the services we can provide. The service we will provide within uh, hydrogen purity analysis and uh, and leakage measurements uh, that we can all that those we can already do now for for hydrogen. Uh, so sorry for methane, but the plan is also to be able to do those for hydrogen, and to extend our laboratory facilities to performance tests and developments of different hydrogen technologies. Now I think the time is more or less up yeah. now. So uh, <laughs> if I look at my watch, so I'll uh, skip the details here. We expect to be able to test the hydrogen qualities within the highest uh, grades uh, uh, suggested by the, the fuel cell standards. And we are expect to do that. We expect to be able to do that within the end of this year. But for the rest uh, of the details of those three points I just talked about, I think you can look on the slides when you get those. Yes, and we will share the slides. Thank you so much, Martin. And uh, yes, just again, in collaboration between FORCE and DGC, we have a, a list of, of facilities that we are, oh, sorry, 
able to provide and stay tuned because we'll get back with more on that once we get started with implementing it more in our um, test facilities. But yes, let's keep the time and thank you so much for staying with us. I can see that pretty much nobody left during the webinar. I guess that's a good sign and we will send out the slides and the recording. So thank you so much for today.